All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me today. As you can see it by the title, today, today I would like to focus on uh, what AI literacy is. And um, after exploring the concept uh, and the definition of AI literacy, I would like to look at how um, to integrate some generative AI tools into existing course assignments. Um, and I selected Grammarly Go and ChatGPT for that reason, but we're going to also touch upon some other tools briefly as well. Um, if you have any questions, just please raise your hand or unmute yourself so you don't have to wait. It's not a presentation, it's really a workshop. So I would like you to um, sort of participate and follow my lead and practice some of the activities that I, I suggest. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and your experience using these tools and uh, trying out some of these tasks. So as you can take a look at the learning ob uh, objectives, you can see that um, one of the objectives is to identify and understand commonly used generative AI tools in academic settings, focusing on Grammarly Go and ChatGPT, critically evaluating some of these AI tools and their appropriateness for certain uh, course activities, developing those strategies for integrating these AI tools, and reconstructing traditional assignments to effectively incorporate some of these AI components that might be part of your homework after the workshop. And, um, and of course, the one of the ultimate objectives is to foster an environment of informed decision making regarding the use of AI tools in pedagogy. And so the first question is here, what is AI literacy? And I collected information from two different sources. One of them is from the ISTE website. So the ISTE organization focuses on the use of technology in education. It's an international society. Um, and so they, they actually place uh, digital literacy and AI literacy within the broad category of what it means to be an empowered learner. And so that's ISTE standard 1.1. And their definition is students leverage technology to take an active role in choosing, achieving, and demonstrating competency in their learning goals informed by the learning sciences. And within the big category of empowered learner, there are four items there, but we're zooming in on technology operations. Students understand the fundamental concepts of technology operations, demonstrate the ability to choose, use, and troubleshoot current technologies and are able to transfer their knowledge to explore emerging technologies. Now, to put it into plain language, I'm referring to this other source that I recently read. It's called AI Literacy Explained. And uh, the authors here basically um, state that learning AI literacy means that you are looking under the hood. So you're really looking into, okay, what is the tool for, um, tool of my choice, and or multiple tools, you know, AI tools, uh, what are they? What are they used for? You know, what can I use um, them in certain situations, or what could you know? What can this tool provide me with? How can it help my creativity? How can it add on to my pedagogy, and so on? So, looking under the hood, looking into the details, and as you do that, um, you, you're participating in the process of demystifying tools. And uh, you explore how these AI tools um, analyze information and communicate information as well. And of course, you know that exploration means um, a lot of practice. You know, you actually using these tools either on your own or with a, another colleague or a small group of colleagues or with your students as well. 
Um, and of course, AI literacy means that you know how to effectively interact with AI tools. And it's definitely not computer science. So very often people, they immediately just think, okay, AI literacy means machine learning. You need to be a computer science major, but actually you don't have to be. I do know some of my colleagues in the ESL field though, who are taking on um, computer science now because they really want to know how things work and how they can um, reach their full potential. So the question is, how do we use these generative AI tools for educational purposes? And what I would like to do first is to look at something uh, fairly frequent, fairly widespread on college campuses. We often ask students to write something. We ask them to write a paragraph or a report or a memo or an essay or a research paper, or of course, you know, we ask them to write an email, we correspond with them. And so if we want, um, students or just ourselves. I mean, when I say, when I use the word students, I also mean us because I'm also a student here. I'm learning how to use these tools. So it's not just my students per se. It's also, you know, I'm included in this uh, learning process as well. But so if we ask students to do um, one of these tasks, to complete one of these tasks, then um, the question is, okay, what kind of assisting AI tools do we recommend for them to use? And so there are two tools out there. Um, they're free. However, with WordTune, the free version is still a little bit limited. So you have um, sort of limited prompts per day. Fullbot is, um, is a lot more um, user-friendly, the free version, but as you can just take a look at the, the images here, you can see that um, WordTune, it used to be just like Grammarly, a grammar checker and a writing assistant, but now because it is also powered by generative AI, now it can do a lot more. It can help people um, write emails, help um, put together a LinkedIn post. So there are quite a few things that it can do for you. So it's not just some sentence level assistance, it's, it's a lot more than that. And Quillbot, again, this is a screenshot of its sort of menu. It's not only a paraphrasing tool, although it started out as one, it also does grammar checking. It serves as a co-writer, just like WordTune or Grammarly. It helps um, with plagiarism checking. It also, it says a citation generator here, but it doesn't necessarily just help generate citations. It also helps with research. So if, um, if a student is looking for um, articles, um, they can use it through Quillbot. So this, um, this platform will, will give them that. So I wanted to mention these two tools before I go on to Grammarly. So Grammarly is the one that I think most of us are familiar with and have been using um, up until the summer it was sort of fairly limited, this, you know, underlying sentences and just uh, using different colors for grammar, for typos, for this and that. But now Grammarly is also AI powered. And as you can see, so again, I took a couple of screenshots of what it can do. And there's actually a lot more than, than this. This was just um, the first thing that popped up as I opened the menu. But so similarly to the other tools, especially WordTune, it can help you write a thank you note um, or um, progress report. Uh, it can write emails. And, um, and even here it says write an engaging introductory email. So you can even specify what kind of emails. When it says tell us to, that's where you actually put in the prompt and, and you, you tell um, AI exactly, let's say, what type of email 
uh, you want it to help you with. You have to feed it with specific information. So it's it's not going to be as easy as let's say with ChatGPT, the chatbot, where you can just say, write an email to my teacher thinking. You actually want to add a lot more information here to end up with something that really makes sense and is more personalized. But if you look at this site here, um, so again, it can do a lot for for writing. And um, and here in this um, sort of chat box, this is where you you feed um, AI with information. Yes. Um, so something that I'm wondering is how we can encourage students to practice these tools without encouraging them to use the tools they used to have, like is doing all the work for them. Or like they like since AI is so like new on the scene, the students are using it right now, and they're interested in plagiarism and academic integrity surrounding AI. Like my concern is saying like, oh, you can use these tools to help you write an email versus use this tool to write an email. Uh -huh. um, do you all have any advice on like how we can like navigate that space? Yes, and I'm about to tell you. <laughs> I'm about to give you the answer. So the question here is, you know, how do we draw that fine line between all these, um, you know, practical use that AI comes with and what you want students to actually do um, with AI, not AI do it for them. So what I would like to do now is what I listed under the learning objectives. Oh, I, sorry, under AI literacy is, you know, looking under the hood. So that's exactly what I would like um, to do now. And so if all of you could please go to Grammarly Go. So you can simply go to Grammarly Go. Or if you have a document, let me just exit the full screen right here. So I prepared this document. Um, because I added Grammarly Go to my Chrome browser, and I believe you can add Grammarly Go to um, a few browsers, and I think it also works in Microsoft Word. So regardless of the, the platform, or the browser you you have opened, you should be able to to get to it. This is what the website looks like. So if you're using Grammarly Go as the website, this is what you should be able to see. And if you have a document open, then this is where you can see uh, Grammarly Go. Um, and so here's the thing. So if you want for instance, if you wanted the student to write a paragraph because you just wanted them to explore a topic and they are about to uh, write a research essay, um, a research paper, and, a, and you just wanted them to start thinking about the topic. So then you might ask them to write a paragraph just to start out with, okay, what do you want to look into? What is going to be the topic of your essay? And so let's assume that in, in my case, um, the topic is digital citizenship. And so the students did a good job, summed up what digital citizenship is. And so now I can tell that the student has a clear idea of what the concept is or what the topic is. And so now I can say, all right, so I'm going to ask you to write an essay about this or a research paper about this. So take the paragraph and using the information, look for more sources, look for information. But of course, you know, let's brainstorm on the topic and let's um, let's see what um, components of digital citizenship, which competencies you really want to look into. So this is when Grammarly can be pretty helpful. So if I wanted to, let's say if I have the document and if I click on, if I open Grammarly, this is when Grammarly doesn't know what, um, what my topic is. So this is sort of the default. If I wanted Grammarly to, and if I have a blank paper because I have nothing, then I, this is where I would say I need to write a paragraph. I need help with a paragraph. So this is where it's 
that is now. But if I already have this information, then I can select the information I have and then open Grammarly and then it already knows what it needs to work on. So I already selected that paragraph. And so it already knows, okay, I'm gonna have to do something with this paragraph. And, uh, and the students can already take a look at the menu items, right? Um, and if I want them to write a research paper, then they can just click on, give me a research plan. And, and it's going to start, you know, spitting out information. Um, so to answer your question, what, you know, where do we draw the fine line? So you might be able to tell the student that you can click on this function using Grammarly. And so it all comes back to um, you as the instructor being aware of the endless possibilities, right? So if I click on more, all right, so this is what my students will see. They will see this, you know, a la carte menu. And so the question is, what do I ask them to use from this list? How far can they go? Um, is it okay if they use it for a research plan? If yes, then okay, so they can brainstorm together with Grammarly. Um, do I allow them to use Grammarly as, as they would use um, any chatbots and look for counter arguments if the paper is an argumentative paper? Um, do I allow them to change um, the tone. So is it formal, casual, or informal? So it's it's almost like what I would recommend um, that teachers actually list which options students can use from this list. Um, and and of course to add the disclaimer, and once they do, the disclaimer will list every item the student clicked on. So there's that. Now you will be using an honor system. So let's say if a student uses another laptop and opens up Grammarly and uses some of these uh, items that you didn't specifically allow, that unfortunately is going to be part of the, the deal. But, um, but I would say that if you explain this, if you are very honest with them, I think they will be honest with you as well when they list the um, disclaimer. And so basically, if you ask them to do this, that, something else, then so, you know, I can click on make it sound more academic, and then it gives me that version. Um, if I want to make it shorter, then of course, it's going to work on that as well. So whatever menu items I want them to use, and they only use those hopefully, then essentially you want them to click on this, which is acknowledge Grammarly um, generative AI use. And once it appears here, then this is something that the students will insert after their work. And so it comes from Grammarly and it's there. Um, another thing that if, um, if you allow them to sort of co-compose um, essays with, with Grammarly, then, um, then Grammarly offers uh, an option and you can actually insert Grammarly as one of the references. And so then you will know, okay, so then <laughs> they really took it to the next level and used it as a co-writer. Um, but just to, to answer the question very briefly, yes, if you allow them to use certain menu items and you actually go and select the ones that they can use, first of all, I think they will know that you, you send a very strong message that you are familiar with the tool, you know what the options are, and you know um, how these options uh, work and what they can provide students with. And so, you know, having that brief conversation or even a longer conversation in the classroom and just attaching those requirements to the assignment, I think that would make the expectations crystal clear. And when it comes to any 
um, you know, academic integrity violations debate, you can clearly say, listen, I asked you or I told you to only use A, B, C, and D. I didn't allow you to use this and that. And that was clearly listed in the assignment. So then it's almost like we're making the job of the, um, the AIC officers a lot easier <laughs> as well, because then they, um, they will have your policy and your expectations clearly um, uh, written down as well. Do you know if there's actually a university policy yet for specific like AI generated stuff uh, that like would be like reference when, or is it based on like sort of what I'm saying is like in the classroom, um, like just in general? Because I'm I'm asking I'm talking maybe not as a instructor but as I work in writing center, mm -hmm. and so when I'm advising students on things that they can use, I want to make sure that I'm following like the university standard as well as what a professor is saying. Um, so this might not be a question for you, this might be a question I have for academic but. <laughs> yes, and I know that Ellison is here with us because I saw her <laughs> entering the room and I, there's no pressure in Ellison on you to, uh, to participate or, uh, to respond, but, um, on one of the slides, I actually added a link to, um, AIC's new SharePoint website. And so there's information about, uh, expectations. So it's going to be there. However, such detailed expectations and rules, I think that is going to be up to um, instructors. And then so they just have to be super upfront about that in their assignments. I think that would be the, the easiest way to, to handle this. All right, so let me give all of you uh, a little bit of time. So the next five, seven minutes, and please go ahead and experiment with, um, either the uh, the website or uh, experiment with if you have a, a document that you can open and put a paragraph or an essay in there and just see what Grammarly can do for you. I have a question. Oh, okay, she has to go first. But, um, so just to follow up on the first question. Um, so if I get this correct, gra Grammarly Go will have what the student wrote initially, and then the revised output. So I get both when it's handed in to me, or is that on the honor system? It's well, okay. So it's the honor system. So then, how do I know what the student wrote and what they're learning versus what Grammarly wrote and what Grammarly learned? The way I do it with, so I teach a, a graduate academic writing course for international students. I ask them to submit their first draft. And then I also ask them to submit the draft that they uh, produce together with uh, one of the assistive AI tools. And do you trust that they do not cheat and give you honestly, honorably what they have done? So I can see their first draft. Yes. And they normally do the, the first draft in class. And so it makes it easy to, so that's, you know, that's my advantage that I can have that in-class writing. And so I know exactly what they do first. And when they use the tools, then, um, then I can clearly see the difference. Yes. And so that's how we, we practice. And we, we normally do this two times. So, you know, I, I need to see this twice. And I also want the students to be in this mindset first draft, and then just even the fact that they are allowed to use these tools, and I teach them how to use uh, the tools properly so that they do uh, end up with the sentences I'm looking for. Um, we look at how when they, when they click on make it formal or make it more academic, and sometimes the sentences become very unnatural, <laughs> like nobody writes like that or nobody speaks like that. And so they understand like, okay, that's a little bit too much. So let's, you know, take it down a notch. And so it, it just requires um, that discussion time. Has any study being done if this really improves their learning or is it gonna really impact in a negative way their learning because they're relying too much on that. Um, so there, um, 
there's an extensive research about um, the topic is not AI, although there has been research about AI tools, but these tools that I'm highlighting here, Grammarly Go and WordTune and Quillbot. So um, there's there's research out there about these tools that used to we used to call them um, automated written corrective feedback tools. Of course, now it's much easier just to say um, artificial intelligence <laughs> or AI tools. But so they had this long name, and if you um, if you type that in, like if you go on uh, even the AI uh, AU library website and you type uh, in that phrase, uh, there's a lot of research out there, and um, I would say that the the consensus is that it improves one's writing skills. Who has done this research? Those who implemented AI, obviously they will support what they have done. Those who have been using these tools in writing courses. So these uh, are people in, you know, specifically in writing courses. Thank you. I have a question. So how, how what's to stop someone from using tools outside of what's allowed? And if so, how do you kind of sort of discover or catch that and how do you yeah make sure that it is outside tool being used instead of just the user changing their writing style because anybody can really change their writing style honestly um so normally in my courses so with the international students it's very very easy um we normally do a diagnostic writing sample um and so they write something on day one so I, I know exactly how they can write. Um, in, in courses, like in the complex problems course, I ask them to do journal writing on day one, and they do that in class. And I ask them to record a blog as well, a video blog on Flipgrid. And so I, I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm able to get a sense of how they speak, how they write just by having sort of, you know, those, those small samples. And so, you know, I, I kind of take notes what, what people can do. And so later on, if I come across a paragraph or, or an essay, something that's um, super duper um, academic, you know, I, I question how, um, how authentic that piece of writing is. I don't know if that answers the question, Peter. Yeah, sort of. I mean, it's like I'm just questioning whether or not this is putting a, a, a little bit of a strain on people's creativity because then they'd be like, oh, what if I go off the grid in my type of writing that would, would like a lot of red flag as if something somebody else wrote it? That could be something that of a concern for students or, yeah, just in general. And when you say someone wrote it, it's when, when are you thinking about students paying? for a service that produces an essay for them? Yeah, they, they, or they could just they could just intermix it with certain parts of it that, that, that they might need more assistance with. But my, my, my point is that if if they write it a certain way, or they're, they, they have shown that they've read, been writing a certain way, but then they want to be, they want to improve and they get creative and then they try, but then they're, they're sort of aware that if they go too creative or too different, then it was gonna, it's gonna raise a red flag with the faculties for for reason that they think that AI might assist it in a, in a way that that becomes not who they wrote, even though it's what they wrote. Right. I mean, that's you know that's always going to be hard to decide. Um, you know, we have talked about how there are some um, tools out there that supposedly detect um, AI use, but then they are not necessarily accurate. So I think that it just comes down to the ultimate question is what are the learning objectives um, for a given assignment? So if you're asking students to, let's say, um, write a problem solution analysis on a certain topic, um, and they do bring in their own sources, it's, it's their thinking, they are synthesizing the information, they are identifying the problem or the problems, 
and offering those solutions supported with sources. Um, I would say that if you can, if, if the point of that assignment was to show critical thinking, analytical thinking, um, then perhaps it was okay to use assistive tools to help with, you know, the sentence structure level. However, once again, if you if you want to detect exactly and and follow what the students are using, then um, asking them to actually go with Grammarly Go, and um, and just explain how Grammarly Go works and that you only allow them to use um, certain you know functionalities from sort of that, that menu that I, um, I, sh uh, I showed a few minutes ago. Um, I would say that that would be fairly straightforward, you know, showing you what they used. And you can, if, and if you think that it was still kind of, you know, way too much, then you can still have the conversation with the student uh, and just say, you know, no, I really want you to use Grammarly as, um, as a spell checker and just work on your mechanics. I don't want you to be a way more creative and um, insert full sentences written by Grammarly for you or you know, instead of you. Um, so I believe in having those conversations. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe I'm cynical, but I really believe that simply the competitive pressure is going to force a lot of students who would not have abused this to decide they have no choice. But I know, tip, I, I'm sure that um, I've gotten far more papers that should, ne you know, should have gotten students kicked out of school, but have no idea. And this just means that probably any student can write a 15 page essay in about 10 minutes and it's going to be hard for me to know. So I'm just thinking at a certain point, I've got to hope that I have enough time to get everybody on a one on one zoom chat and do some sort of uh, oral review. Either you can come in with, uh, you know, give me a written paper and we'll discuss it or you know i'll just give you a regular oral exam but anything written is going to be extremely difficult to verify and you know i don't know what percentage of students at this university or any other university uh cheat but a lot of them will oh they do yes they do and you know we catch you know, 1% of it. Right. So, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that you can write um, a long essay in 10 minutes or so. Uh, and, it, and if somebody does, then you can easily tell. And then you can just say, yeah, this is not what I asked for. So if you have very specific requirements for an assignment, I think that it should slow students down. I don't think that, um, you know, their work would be, um, that quick and and once again i think that if you show students yourself that you are familiar with how these tools work and take i don't know 25 35 45 minutes of a class time just um just doing what i you know what i did in the past 25 minutes and okay here's a paragraph you know putting up a sample that's typical of your class and this is how Grammarly works. And so I know that it's very enticing. There are all these opportunities that in this class, I only allow you to use this and this and this. And please understand that I'm grading you for your creativity, for your insight. And so once I detect that it comes from Grammarly, I can no longer accept it. And I think if they see that there is, um, a lot less, a lot more resistance um, for cheating. My international students, so my personal experience is that the international students um, 
as soon as these tools became widely available and free, it, I mean, it just opened up a whole new world for them. And yes, they started using them relentlessly. <laughs> um, but I stopped them on their first try. And we had the discussion and I, you know, I, I made them use even ChatGPT in a way that it would allow them to look into how the tool can also work so that it's not doing the work for them, but with them. And, um, and so I don't have those cheatings anymore. I'm sorry, doesn't it put a lot of pressure on faculty? For instance, I'm sure you have enough experience. If a student can barely, barely have any opinion about something that you are discussing in class, you show opinion and some points, and now all of a sudden comes with this marvelous paper. Where did that come from? He or she can barely talk or say something about such and such subject. Now all of a sudden, and it, I think it is very, very difficult to say it seems some cheating is here. I don't know, but puts a lot of pressure on faculty that what is going on here? Right. Have you so, had this experience? Uh, yes. Yeah, so let's let's talk about some other tools as well and see what we can do about that. Um, and before I do that, just one last thing that I wanted to recommend. Um, so I tell students, I ask them to take notes about, um, now see, this is one way where you can sort of reduce the, the number of cheatings, right? Or the amount of um, cheating that might go on. I ask students when I assign chapters to read, I ask them to take notes. It's not an option, it's mandatory, and the students don't like it because they have to read and they have to take notes. And they don't just take random notes, they actually have to take organized notes. But they do understand that because they do this before they come to class, when, um, when they come to class and we have an actual discussion that's a graded discussion, then they can go back here and pull information. So they will have something to say because by then they thought about it at home as they were taking notes here. Um, this is really not something that an AI tool um, can do for them because they actually have to um, quote from the chapters and they have to cite the, the page numbers and so on. So this is this is a task, for instance, that AI will not be able to do for them. However, when the students do this, I recommend that they use Grammarly Go or some other um, assistive tool that can help um, write better sentences. So once again, once they come to class, they have to have the they have to participate in a discussion. They have full sentences um, to use. So, uh, Christina, question for you, which is my, uh, how do you draw the conclusion that the AI cannot read the text for them and give notes? Because my experience with t talking to students is that's one of the main ways in which they are using ChatGPT, for example, which is that they're using it instead of doing the reading and having the AI summarize the reading or asks for three questions from the reading when the faculty member asks for that. Right, so um, in this case, um, and if you're a librarian now, please close your ears, but I don't use OER material. So they have to get the, these books and these are brand new. They're not available online. So Chad GPT will not have access to these tools. I mean, uh, to these chapters. One other parameter is anybody outside the school system helping them. I yeah. teach math. I teach math. And for instance, on one occasion, a student took the test in class over 30 minutes the whole time, got 33 on the test. It was online. And then I gave them an extra, anybody wants, and two hours later, we finished around two at four o'clock. I gave them the extra. In 18 minutes, he finished 
he finished and got 89. I said, you know, I'm not that smart, but something is wrong. In two hours, all of a sudden, you improve so well that you go from 30 something to 80 something, something is wrong. That is all I said. And I sent a copy to her, to his academic advisor, it was on a Thursday, Monday, he came, I need to drop the course. Mm -hmm. We have yeah, had so we have had occasions that we have noticed by checking IP. Yes, a student is taking the test, but somebody from Hong Kong was doing the test. Now, is there any way if we can check that you know somebody off campus is not helping them? Yeah, I think that that's a question um, that you can talk about with someone from the AIT office. I that's not something that I. I can do. I mean, I might be able to offer you something throughout the um, this workshop, but I not directly to. Sorry, <laughs> I can't really? do that question. Have you come across anything like this to look into it or not? No, not in my courses. No, not in my courses. No. Um, but let me just um, sort of close the the part about um, Grammarly and WordTune and Quillbot. So this is something that I tell students. So this is what they can see um, when, when they receive an assignment. At the bottom of the assignment, they have this warning from me. So it says, demonstrate integrity. Do not use ChatGPT, Google Bard. Um, and yeah, I mean, it only takes the, the, the one occasion when I can tell and I tell the student that I can tell so please don't do it again and then they understand I also talk about these tools so they know that I am aware of the tools as well so I know that that's my sort of advantage that I uh, I'm familiar with them and so I know that for instructors who are less familiar with the tools it can be a challenge and an extra you know burden to Sort of delve into what these can do and, and how to use them. Um, however, so I, I put this uh, at the bottom of each assignment so then the students can see that I'm actually, you know, I'm allowing them to use certain AI tools if they are desperate to use AI tools, but I list exactly the kinds that they can use. And I haven't done so. However, my plan for next semester is start adding these pictures as well on Canvas. So then it's crystal clear what can be used and what cannot be used. So if someone has any, you know, other uh, sort of doubts, any student can still doubt what, then, you know, they, it's going to be very apparent what can be used and what cannot be used. Uh, earlier, I talked about the academic integrity code um, and the office, and so um, I'm going to share the link of these presentations with you, and so you can click and, and go to the SharePoint and, and look at information specifically for faculty, so some resources. Um, now, so let's let's move on to the generative AI part of, um, of this workshop. So let's suppose you're clear about what students can do when it comes to writing and how they can improve their written work, um, you know, which tool they can use, which functionalities they can use when it comes to the tools. And then you also put the warning there. Students understand they have to provide a disclaimer. So let's move on to um, generative AI and the chat box. Um, I have only experimented with these three. I know that there are other tools out there, but Google Bar, ChatGPT, and this last one here is called Claude AI. Um, these three tools can help with um, reading comprehension, information synthesis, brainstorming, feedback, and personalized tutoring. Um, and of course, they can help they can help with math as well i used um chat gpt to help my nine-year-old because he had to do some long divisions he's in the fourth grade i forgot how to do long divisions so especially with multiple <laughs> digits and but i prompted chat gpt in a way that chat gpt wouldn't be able to give the answers so my son had to sit there and uh and chat gpt acted as an ai tutor and we had a successful session because like I said, I forgot how to do these operations. 
Um, another um, use of these tools, and this is that you can allow if you want to, you can allow your students to do, is to receive feedback on a completed written work. But again, you have to be very clear and tell students on their completed work. So it's not these tools doing the work for them. Once they complete the work, then ask these tools to help, for instance, uh, either revise their work or revision is probably not the best when it comes to these tools. Grammarly and WordTune and Quillbot do so much better at revising written work. However, what these tools can do is provide feedback whether or not the completed work meets the expectations uh, listed in your grading rubric. So if they have um, a paragraph, a math problem, um, uh, or even if, if students are writing cover letters because they are applying for jobs, you can teach them, listen, you know, copy the ad in um, ChatGPT or Bard or Claude AI and copy your cover letter and ask if your cover letter actually matches um, the job description. And it's going to do a very good job pointing at what is still missing. So that's a very nice practical use. But if, if it's an essay, then again, put the essay in there and receive that use. Now, if you're wondering, okay, they're just going to cheat and they're just going to do this and that, what you should request is you should request students to share the chat link with you. So they have to, as they do that chat with any of these chat bots, there's a shareable link and they share it with you and you can actually see that conversation. So there doesn't have to be an honor system. You can actually see the conversation. And so you can request that. But isn't it too much load on faculty? Well, I think it just depends on how you, um, you know, how do you, how you design your course. If, um, you know, my personal experience is that um, the way I design the course is that it's, you know, yes, it, it, I have time to, to look at those, those chats. Those chats are not necessarily extensive, so they're not very long. Um, and maybe this is something that will go away in five, six years, but now I feel like it's necessary, so then we can all stay honest. And what you're saying is, yes, initially it's a burden because it's it's a learning curve for me. It's, you know, it's learning for them. So I hear you. <laughs> I'm not going to lie that it's, oh, it's going to be this fast and this easy. No, no, it's, it's learning. Yes. But, um, but I think that if I, if I think about, um, you know, efficacy, when I think about myself, what I do and my students, I think that they can learn a lot. Um, and if you think about it, why have them wait to meet me, you know, when I'm free for office hours or when we meet again in class, when they can receive that feedback using AI at, you know, 1 a.m., 5 p.m., whenever, you know. 3 a.m. Yes, most likely. <laughs> Most likely. So if you have the time and the opportunity, you know, I encourage you to try it out. If you have a, you know, an essay and if you have um, your prompt and your grading rubric to copy that into one of these um, AI chatbots and see what kind of feedback it gives you. Um, if you don't trust your students that they will do a thorough enough job, you can provide those prompts for them. And I will talk about prompts in the next few minutes. Um, I do want to take a couple of minutes here and see if you want to try this out or if you have any experience doing anything like this, asking students to, to use AI as, um, as a free assistant. I would like to ask, has anybody ever had an experience where they 
uh, asked for an essay, and then they got basically four versions of the same thing. Uh, I mean, I know that with that <laughs> thing, you can get a slightly different version. And, you know, I've argued with it, et cetera, and that's usually fun. Uh, but uh, is there any risk that the students will all get the same uh, sort of answer or the same mistake? Because I do find it does make factual mistakes. Uh, and it, it profusely apologizes, but, you know, it did make a mistake. So is, are there any tells uh, or any way to look for those tells when you get a bunch of essays back? Look for some keywords. And this is something that I haven't told my students because I'm reserving this right to, <laughs> um, to identify. But um, for some reason, there is some keywords that ChatGPT and Google Bard just love using. And um, for instance, delve into an argument is one phrase that all these tools will use. That's like their go-to phrase. Um, or, you know, this topic has, or, you know, something, um, explore this multifaceted argument. So that's, that's another word just comes up all the time. Um, or the way the responses are um, formatted. So normally you don't get your typical five paragraph essay. The paragraphs are two to three sentences lumped together. Um, very often, those two to three sentences lumped together start with a couple of keywords highlighted so that it's easy to tell. Um, the font is Roboto, so then that's easy to identify. And it used to be, and with the newest update, they took it away. So that made me very disappointed. Um, if students simply copied and pasted from ChatGPT, then there was um, like a background that was like lightly gray. So you could see like, oh, it was a copy and paste, <laughs> but that's taken away. So now there's, there's no such thing. The font size is still the same and the font type is still the same. So you can identify that. However, you know, this is something that students know. So, okay, Times New Roman, size 12. So that, that's something that they can, uh, but I would say that the more you personally experiment with um, these tools, the more phrases you can recognize, like um, the power of, or unleashing, unleashing, or empowering. So there's certain words that um, that these tools use very, very often. And if so, students don't understand the power of revision, they're going to leave these words in there and it's like, oh, <laughs> sounds like a robot. So there's that. But I, and that's why I, I recommend, you know, using it and reading the information that it spits out. So then you know the, the formula and, and then you can see um, the language easily. All right, so let me move on to this next page. So um, this is another um, warning that students can see in, um, in one of my assignments in which I actually ask them to use uh, ChatGPT or Google Bard or Claude AI, because for instance, I want them to either synthesize information with the help of um, AI so they can see how it works because I kind of want it to be their model and so they can model um, the technique. Um, or if I want ChatGPT or Claude to be um, their personalized tutor, and I will talk about that as well. Um, and so in this case, uh, this is the list that the students will, um, will see. Uh, also, if I want them to, well, for example, in my intercultural understanding course, I asked students to create a memo. So we're looking at um, a situation 
two cultures meet and there's some misunderstanding and they have to apply um, contrastive theories as they explain what happened. So they have to use those theories as, as explanations of what happened and they have to write, they have to pretend like they are a case manager and they have to type, mem they have to type up a memo. And so I tell them that for the writing part, um, they can use Grammarly or WordTune, and just to make it easy, they can use voice typing um, in their Google Docs. And so then I tell them, but once you're done with your memo, copy the grading rubric into AI and copy your memo in there and see if you actually thought about everything that I asked you to add. And and ChatGPT or uh, Bard or Claude AI are not going to fix it for them. They're just going to say that this point is incomplete. This information is still messing, missing. You might want to think about adding this and that. So it's going to suggest how they can improve the final version. Um, and so that's, again, just using the, the icons and the check marks just to make it clear what they can do, but then also the very detailed bullet points so that they, uh, that they know that you, know, you use the specific tool for a specific purpose, not just you know, randomly. Um, so these three tools are very good for brainstorming as well. Um, Google Bard is very, very good for generating titles. So if you need a title for um, an essay, for a research project, for a presentation, Google Bar does a fantastic job. I mean, it will come up with endless opportunities. And so we're using Bard with my students um, in my academic discussion course when they have to work on the presentation titles and then we look at the options and very often they realize that it's not a simple copy paste from the list it gives them but it's like merging three titles into one it's like i like the beginning of this title but then i like how this one ends so then i'm so then again the process of editing right so that it's still part of the writing the process of editing and so I, I can tell those, you know, light bulbs are going off when, when we're doing this work. Um, as you notice, I took off Google Bard from the list here because Google Bard is not very good when it comes to tutoring and comprehension and um, personalized tutoring. Google Bard does a very bad job, but Claude AI and ChatGPT are amazing. So they can be very, very good tutors. However, tutoring comes with prompting. Um, so if you signed up for this workshop, you probably received an email and it said um, you can watch some of these videos. So Jeff Su is, um, is a YouTuber who has produced multiple videos uh, helping people um, I think that his first interest is marketing and business, not necessarily teaching, but he actually explains um, the thought that goes behind um, prompting and how to prompt him to, uh, how to prompt these AI chatbots. And so he emphasizes that you need to give it a persona, you need to give it a context, you need to give it a very specific task, a format, an example, and the tone as well. And he also um, clarifies that these two, uh, no, the task is mandatory and these two contexts and example are important and these are not necessary but if you actually add all of them to a prompt, um, AI will take up that persona and will be task driven and will actually help you um, be more efficient or in our case to help students with a certain task and act as a tutor. Um, so I took some screenshots from the video itself. Um, and so, he really emphasizes those, you know, verbs that you want to um, to feed it when it comes to those tasks, and you have to be very specific. So saying simply, "Oh, create or write," mm, that's not specific enough. But if you say summarize, categorize, analyze, so those action verbs, the more specific they are, 
um, the better the outcome will be. And uh, if you look at some of these examples, so providing context of basically what's happening, this is when I tell the students in their prompts that they have to write, you know, I'm an international student, graduate level, um, in college, uh, intermediate English proficiency, and so on. So then there's the context. So then the AI understands not to use two very sophisticated words or very long sentences that make it simple. Uh, or when I'm tutoring my son, it's long division, and I don't know how to do it, then I, you know, I say fourth grader, somebody's struggling with long division. So there's that context right there. Um, giving it a persona. So uh, here for, you know, marketing purposes, the, the, these are some of these examples. I tell chatbots, you are an encouraging tutor, or I say you're an encouraging but very rigorous tutor. So you want those answers. You can't let the students just, you know, take it easy and just give out semi-complete answers. Um, you know, giving the format, what kind of format you want it to create. Do you want a memo? Do you want a report? Um, or here, you know, a table, it can create tables as well. So those people who work with, you know, Excel sheets or um, spreadsheets, then, then that's something that, again, it can do. Or email, you know, as a format. Um, now, feeding chatbots and asking them to provide feedback, you can tell it to, if it makes changes, to bold all the changes. So it's really nice and user-friendly. So you can actually follow what changes it recommended and made. Um, and Jeff Sue also emphasized that when you talk about tones, you can actually ask ChatGPT, what are those tone keywords? Because I'm not so sure. And then so it's going to list uh, all the information as well. So here is one prompt example from him. Again, I highly recommend watching not only this video, but any of the videos that he created. Uh, he created longer ones and sort of beginner to more advanced as well about prompting. So into prompting, you know, a lot of information goes in there. But as you can see, so for instance, in, in marketing, if you're a marketing manager, um, if AI helps you produce something, you know, you can, you can be done much faster. And what it gives you, it's not a simple copy paste. You still probably have to go there and edit and, and revise the suggestion as well. So it's not going to be foolproof, but at least you have something to work with. Um, okay, so here's an example of what my students um, had to do recently. So I gave them two articles to read, and they had to copy this into ChatGPT or Claude AI. And what it did for the students, it started a conversation with them about the two texts. And it required the students to synthesize the information. And it also picked specific information from the articles. And it asked the student to respond to the information, but it also asked the student to, again, cite information in their responses to um, sort of provide evidence to their arguments or to their claims. Now, in one of my classes, the students used this activity three times, and the third time was just last week. And when I showed them what the homework is, they started, um, can you guys still, uh, can you help me? Cause my, <laughs> my screen went blank. I don't know what happened. Oh, I know that. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, it's still playing. Okay, I can, I can just turn back and, and talk like that, yes. Um. Um, so basically, I asked students to, to do this, and they started organizing a riot, 
And when I asked them what happened, they said, it's so much work and we actually have to do this. And I said, what, well, you guys love ChatGPT? And they started laughing and they said, yeah, but not when it's asking us questions. We like it the other way around. And I said, well, thank you. And I said, well, that's, that's tough. I'm so sorry, but this is the one where you actually learn with ChatGPT. They were like, but it's asked us so many questions and we actually have to read and analyze. And I said, yeah, well, that's the point. If you look at the learning objectives, that's exactly what you have to do. And I said, I know you find it challenging. It should be challenging. That's why you're here. You're welcome. Um, and so if you look at step three, it says here, copy your chat link. So then the students have to share their chat with me. And, you know, and it's, it's interesting because I can see that some students are very thoughtful. They actually go and extract a lot of information. Some will still be a little bit lazy. And so they're not going to get the full score. Um, but I can tell that everybody read the articles and everybody thought about those articles. And so when they come to class and it's time to talk, they will actually ha have something to share. They can go back to their notes and they will share the information. Um, so this is, you know, this is one thing to, um, to think about that you might want to apply in your course. Yeah, I think something just. Christina, while you're maybe a, someone there who's a techie uh, can answer, figure out your, whoops, if you can yeah. go back. Go so, back. Oh. Yeah, just to that assignment, which is very interesting to me. Oop. The other direction. But, well, I just, rather than, what would be the advantage of that assignment as opposed to just asking the students to read these articles and... Okay. Um, sorry, sorry you're, everybody. We're, Christina's computer just died. <laughs> There goes the tech person. Um, <laughs> but see, we're sharing the screen from your. I don't know why this is still it. That's interesting. Um, All right. Just I'll let you keep going. But my question was, why not just have, have the students read the article and come in with um, some ideas? No, but I think. Yes, we, we do spend quite a bit of class time on, on this. So they, there is tutoring for sure. All right, so I'm almost completely back to my slide. I apologize. Okay, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, thank you. Oh, share my screen, yes. sorry. Yes. Now, there is something that I'm still trying to figure out, and maybe you can help me think about this, and maybe next time we can talk about this, <laughs> and that's um, where to place uh, the need for a disclaimer when it comes to students, and also where to, where to put what I showed you earlier, basically, you know, let me just go back to the information. So when I have the warning, right, or when I have these icons and the check marks or the X marks of what's allowed and what's not allowed. So when I put together an assignment, it has three sections, the learning objectives, the instructions, you know, how do you do this and the, um, uh, the part, you know, what is going to be graded and how, so the grading rubric. And so right now I'm putting everything with the grading rubric so it's, that's, that's where things are and at the bottom of the assignment. But what I'm trying to work on now is, you know, where do I place it? Or maybe I should place it in each section so it's completely apparent. It's sort of, you know, in your face experience <laughs> that, you know, what's allowed and what's not allowed and what the expectations are. Um, so that's something that I, you know, I invite you to, to think about and, um, and suggest. Um, 
maybe this is something that with the AIC office we can, you know, we can th think about where where would it be the best to to place all the information. Um, this is a grading rubric that I assigned um, this week, and so I thought that I add the information about the disclaimer at the bottom of the grading rubric right there. And at this point, I didn't add the score because I just didn't know how to weigh it. <laughs> like how, how much of that would be part of the assignment and where would it even go? Um, so I, I'm personally figuring everything out. However, in my complex problems, the students have started adding disclaimers. So it's been um, two weeks now and you know, some just kind of write it, I use that some others understand that you can do the acknowledge and then insert. So we're we're experimenting and we're learning how to do it. But I think, you know, it's it's just so new for everyone, but they do understand the need for the disclaimer. Um, and I, you know, I had students in the complex problems uh, during week one or two who used ChatGPT to um, to cheat to basically do the task for them, um, but we talked about it. They resubmitted the work. They completed on their own, so they understood, and it, it never happened again. I think it takes that one time, and I was happy that you know they failed during the beginning <laughs> of this process, so that we can. Uh, that we we had the um, the chance to actually figure things out together, and so that was uh, so. Here is my recommendation, you know, for you. And if you need help with this, please reach out to me, or if you want to come to another coffee chat about AI and just talk about what you might have or how you might have done this, taking a traditional assignment rewriting the assignment with AI uh, incorporation. So following some of the suggestions that I shared with you, or, you know, you can tweak it and just modify it. So then it fits your discipline. It fits your, you know, subject. Um, what are those assistive AI tools that you might allow students to use and how, or generative AI tools and what you might allow them to use and how. Um, in which section of your assignment you actually refer to AI and how. So, that, so that's something that I invite you to come talk about. Uh, I think the more we share, the, the smarter we are or we will become. And um, I have some questions here, but I know that we're out of time and I apologize for the tech <laughs> mishap that I caused or my laptop caused and slowed us down. Again, you know, questions to think about. And next time when we get together for a coffee chat, maybe this is something that we can definitely discuss. Um, in conclusion, I know that cheating is out there and I know that students are using AI for shortcuts and to complete the tasks for them. I also believe that we can't escape having that conversation with the students and showing them that you know we know what's happening um i think that that will create a semi-honor system if i may add just one sentence this gets a big plus i compared it 35 years ago i wrote my dissertation using computers teaching mathematics everybody was saying wow 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 now, this exactly reminds me of 35 years ago. Well, history shows that, you know, how much are used and the same thing and the students will benefit. This is my just personal opinion based on experience. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Welcome. Does anyone have any questions? All right, well, thank you so much for coming. And um, again, if you want to talk about these questions and if you want to talk about these tools,
sit down and experience with them, please reach out and we can meet up and see how I can help you.